Sir, thank you so much for joining us here in Davos. And My thank pleasure. you for taking the time to speak to Bloomberg TV. When you look um, at the QIA's investment over the next 10 years, where do you see the biggest opportunity? I think we have been very vocal on this. I mean, we are diversifying our, our portfolio in a way that we need to increase our exposure and technologies, healthcare. And of course, with the theme of the climate change, I think infrastructure is a big sector that we are investing on. Where do you see the best and biggest opportunity in technology? Is it in Asia, China, or is it elsewhere? We see a race between, between the U.S. and China. It's a big race. I think they are ahead of other regions. I see some momentum within the Europe, between, especially in the fintech, between, between the U.K. and Berlin. And they are, uh, I think, uh, we are in the era of technologies, and we, we believe that we are in the middle of this era. I think we are, we are moving ahead, and everyone is trying to catch up in terms of investing in technologies. I mean, if you think about the pace of change in technology over the last five years, it's absolutely incredible. Will the next five years be even quicker? And so what does it mean for the investments that you will choose? How quickly will those technologies change? Absolutely. It's disturbing any any sort of sectors, even with the, with a very classical conventional sector like re real estate technologies is getting into the specification of, the, you know, of, of the real estate that mm -hmm. we are building. Mm -hmm. So it's getting involved in every single aspect of our investment. Okay, what is your, um, if you look at healthcare, is healthcare disrupted by technology or is there something else that you would be looking at for good Absolutely, investments? healthcare. I, as I told you, technology is impacting every single sector, including the healthcare. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's really enhancing the, the performance of a lot of venture capital is a big, a big element in both in healthcare and technologies itself. So it's impacting financial, healthcare, real estate, uh, you know, uh, and, and infrastructure as well. When you look at sustainability, really the, the big talk here in Davos, what are the steps that the QIA is taking to Absolutely. ensure that you're a step with, you know, you're in line with the times? Personally, personally, I believe that the, 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 the people have, have admitted the fact that we have a problem. Uh, this is because of the education, because of the orientation that the public has been uh, exposed to. Mm -hmm. At the same time, by the hard time of the crisis that we are hearing in Australia or Brazil, this is, uh, this is I think, uh, learn people that we have a problem and we have to come all together in terms of really in, in investing and enhance our climate. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, QIA, I think we have been very uh, thoughtful about the investment that we are, we are making and we are trying to impact positively to the market that we are investing on. For example, in December last year, we have invested in, uh, in power distribution in India and Mumbai. Mm -hmm. And this business distribute to 55% of the population of mm -hmm. Mumbai. We have tried to apply our discipline to this, to this business. Mm -hmm. We bought a stake. The business now takes 3% from, from, uh, from the re renewable resor mm -hmm. resource and 30% uh, from the coal uh, source. We have agreed with, the, with our partner, who have I agree, a great uh, respect, that we need to increase the 3% of the renewable to 30% by 2023, and the 30% to 50% in 2025. And in, in a 10 years time, the coal business should be shutting down. I think this is a great impact investment that we are bringing a lot of positive to the people of India and bring them a lot of prof prosperity. So, so does it mean that uh, most of your future investments will be structured the same way? That, that you'll make sure about the sustainability um, and long-term climate change impact? Absolutely, 44% of our infrastructure project are uh, uh, a zero emission uh, investment. And we are, we are not gonna invest more in coal business. Mm -hmm. So we need to, we are very thoughtful to, to the climate change and we need, as a sovereign wealth fund, we need to have a policy toward this. Uh, will you try and extract yourself from, uh, I guess, previous investments that could have a, a coal component or a fossil fuel component? For example, we, we, it's a fact that we have some investment in the, in the oil and gas uh, companies. Okay. This is a fact mm -hmm. and, and this is a sector that you, can, you cannot ignore. Uh, it takes part of the weight of the of the benchmark, and you have to invest. However, we will not. We do not. I do not see ourselves expanding on that. Mm -hmm. As you know, most of our income comes from hyd hydrocarbon mm -hmm. business, and we have to fulfill our obligation. I think we have to diverse from this mm -hmm. 
So I do not see that that's part of the, of the, of the portfolio will expand that much. Um, when you look at infrastructure around the world, again, where do you see the best investments? Is it because of government spending as well? Is it a part of the world that maybe is growing better than others? No, I think it's a, it's a yielding business. When you invest in uh, infrastructure as, uh, uh, is in demand by all government. And I think uh, most of the people are really utilizing the, their infrastructure. It's a basic element of any economy. And I think it's it's very important component to our portfolio. And we are expanding that much in terms of the infrastructure, either in power business, airport, uh, uh, renewable business. So we are very active in the sector. What about real estate? How's that going? Real estate is, is a sector <laughs> that uh, it is very classical. It's very close to our heart. So we will always invest in real estate. It is, uh, you know, we, we, we deal with it as a yielding investment. Mm -hmm. And it is an important element to our portfolio. Um, how do you look at the U.S.-China trade war and the subsequent phase one trade deal? Will it hold? And how do you hedge some of, I guess, the risks that you face because of that? See, this is one of the events that we are uh, ranking number one in terms of risk management. We are monitoring the situation very closely. I think the, the, uh, the signing of the stage one, I think this is a positive step that both parties are taking and it will, it will make the momentum continue in 2022. Uh, so I'm very optimistic about 20, uh, tw uh, 2020. 2020. So, uh, so uh, I think, but this is a very complicated issue. It will take years in terms of discussion and making sure that they reach a final stage of discussion. So what happens if tariffs are back? Right? What happens if there are tariffs against Europe? But are we now in a, in a uh, tariff, um, you know, extensive economy? Yes. Uh, you are talking about discussion between the largest two economies. Both of them are controlling around... 40% of the of the global uh, economy. So, having a discussion and, and a tariff, uh, you know, uh, imposed by these two major economies, of course, it has an impact on a global basis. It might tackle a slowdown as well. You know, uh, we are very, we have a huge investment in Europe and Germany, and, and they are very, uh, you know, trading exposed to to this sort of. So we are very. Uh, conscious mm -hmm. about about this discussion and we are m monitoring the development mm -hmm. very closely. Uh, we talked about sectors. What are regions where you think there will be value in 2020 but also 2021? Is this the time where Europe comes back or is it some emerging economies? See, Europe, um, we have been very vocal about Europe. You, Europe because of the proximity, because we have a little bit of concentration and, and for the last two years we have been very vocal in terms of expanding in, in the U.S. market and Asia in general. Most of our investment, to be honest with you, going in these two markets. Mm -hmm. uh, the US, it, it doesn't mean that we are stopping investment in Europe, but we are being very selective mm -hmm. so we can rebalance our portfolio. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and we will be very opportunistic in, in, in the Europe market. Uh, so what kind of thing are, are you looking at? I mean, without going into specifics, it, you know, are we priced to perfection? Uh, are, are companies too expensive at the moment? It is, it is. But, you know, it's, uh, we are very fundamental and thoughtful about in the process of investing. We get into the fundamental of the, mm -hmm. of the business. We make sure that and we apply some so, sort of uh, sensitive analysis in terms of, you know, the risk profile of, the, of each uh, investment. And we do not really leverage that much of every single opportunity. So we are a little bit and we always apply that we have to be very diversified. Mm -hmm. And this is, takes out a lot of the risk in our portfolio. Uh, I know you're a great student of economics and you look at uh, you know, ratios and things like that. Is, is our central banks skewing the system? So are, are you worried when we start normalizing rates, which we said for the last three years we would, yes. that that time will be extremely risky for markets? I think, but it, I, I do not see this happening in okay. the near future. I think, I think the major player uh, that we see for the next few years would be the financial, uh, f financial game. I mean the Ministry of Finance in terms of spending, because as you know, central bank has reached their bottom bottom and they do not have any leverage in terms of really st stimulus the, the, the economy. So uh, I think uh, um, uh, minister, you know, ministers of finance have a big responsibility in the, in the future. But you think that will come? Is 2020 the year where maybe globally on a net basis we'll see more fiscal spending? I think in 2020 I'm, I'm a little bit very optimistic. I'm, I'm worried about thereafter in terms of really having the geopolitical issue that might tackle any slowdown. 
any trade issue that might uh, tackle. And also the virus that we have been hearing right now about in China, it might be also another issue that the economy might face if we did not really contain it. Mansour Ahmad, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much.